Our next speaker is uh, Mr. Harun Awan, Anwar, and he heads the Standard Chart Bank transaction business in Malaysia and is responsible for managing multiple portfolio uh, in the area of trade finance, cash management, securities for corporate and institutional clients. And he has also held leadership positions with Standchart, Citibank, ABN, Ambro, and uh, BMO Bank of uh, Montreal. With over 20 years of banking experience in Asia and in America, he specialized in corporate banking, treasury management, and international trade finance. And in year 2007, he joined Standchart uh, Global Product Management Team in Singapore and prior to moving to Malaysia. He was actually um, the head of uh, the country head for transaction banking in Vietnam. So uh, without further delay, uh, let's welcome Mr. Harun and he will be talking about what is the role of trade and investment policy uh, in, in the area of supply chain finance. Right, Mr. Harun. Thank you, Albert. Um, if you don't mind, I'll stand right here. And the intent is, no, I didn't mean to have you. <laughs> the intent is for us to use the presentation more as a guide and uh, oh. for me to be able to uh, have conversations with you. Because when I was uh, requested by Albert to come and speak to a lot of uh, policymakers, it uh, did intimidate me. And I told him, I said, this is normally not my audience, but he said, do try to talk about how financial supply chain links with the physical supply chain and what are the areas which the policy makers should keep in mind when we are trying to look at how banking relates to the supply chain and development of an economy. So that led to, and let's see if this works, uh, coming together with a general guide on what, are, what is supply chain? What is the significance of supply chain financing to economies? How does it facilitate trade across borders and within the country? And why is it significant for us to talk about it today? So let's get started with basically, yes, there is actually a chain. Okay? So the idea is when we have number of companies interacting and transacting with each other, selling goods across to each other, we are creating relationships. We are creating relationships for buyers. We are creating relationships for sellers. But how does that relate to us? Well, the main thing is, as we were talking about it earlier, when we are trying to promote investments, we are trying to get FDIs in, some of these large institutions and organizations that come to our countries, they create jobs. They create opportunities. They create opportunities for SMEs to supply to them. But SMEs do not have unlimited access to capital. And how do we create an environment where our SMEs can th thrive and the jobs can be created and the economy can grow? So what um, the supply chain finance is, it takes the concept away from a regular bilateral lending, so I look at a company and I say, good company will pay, I will lend you money. We move away from that concept and start looking at transactions and say, listen, this company is selling to a well-known multinational, let's say Unilever or Shell. And I think Unilever and Shell are very reputable risk. And if we have payments coming in from Unilever and Shell, to this client, and we don't do much analysis of the client, we look more as where the payment is coming from, we finance that transaction. So that's the biggest shift in what supply chain is versus bilateral lending. Now this can take place on both sides. So if we were to look at one of these large corporations as buyer, and we will call them anchor because we have, we have to link it with supply chain, then they could be either financing the suppliers or the buyers, and we will look at that part as we go further in the presentation. My apologies, I will continue even though with the call of prayers. Okay. 
So over the last few years, we have seen some industry trends. And uh, there's been an emergence of trade, trade additionally happening and it projected to grow south to south trade within Asia. Um, we are seeing more trade when we say south to south among develop, developing countries. And uh, the center of gravity is shifting from the traditional markets more to Asia. Now what it does is it also creates a need for some of these um, large buyers, and we, we talked about iPhone earlier today, Apple, and those examples, that they want to stretch. They want to stretch the maximum credit terms they can get from their suppliers. And there is an interest among our countries to be able to export more and more. So how do we do that? How do we make it really happen? And there are certain things which are helping us make it happen, and those things are all around how technology is helping us have better information, move things faster, and share information. So it's not only the physical supply chain, but the resulting supply chain in the financial space that is making these transactions happen. So here's one slide which I thought might uh, invoke interest for uh, policymakers, is the link of the actual prices of commodities and the financial markets, what happens. So some of you who have been involved in food and agriculture may recall that between 2002 to 2007, there was a rampant, rampant increase in food prices globally and caused a lot of concern uh, as the price of rice and wheat and other commodities went up. But there was a reason. There was a reason because initially when people used to buy forwards to hedge against the commodity prices, suddenly became very, very lucrative for hedge fund managers and other such non-player investors to start taking position in that. And the money was cheap. And they started doing that. So we saw, I'll just draw this, a sudden peak. This is right around June, December 2008. And there's this peak on the cost of credit. And then when it came down, right after the uh, Lehman Brothers crisis, guess what happens out with a lag? The prices of commodities also come down. And what this means to us when we are making policies around this is we cannot let this impact the chains, the value chains we are building, because it impacts the companies, it impacts the economies, it impacts their working capital requirements. So how do we address that going forward? We can have question answers on that particular slide later as well. All right, so supply chain concept going from bilateral trade to transactional financing led to this where the buyers and suppliers both started to say, hey, where's the advantage? Where's my advantage? So from a buyer perspective, again, I'll take the Apple example because we talked about it this morning, uh, thanks to you. And uh, so they, they want to extend their terms. They want to delay their payments as much as possible. But the suppliers may not be as large as the Taiwanese company. They might be small suppliers as well. In the, and they cannot afford to continuously meet the demands of these large buyers because they can only put up so much collateral. So what it is, so, so what it is that the buyers can provide, they can provide their better risk rating to the banks. And when we know that a better payment can come from that buyer, we can provide financing to the supplier based on that. And that is the main crux of what supply chain is. This can happen on both sides. But that, if you take away one point, that is the crux of what supply chain financing provides to us. And now what we need to do is figure out how we can make it happen in the markets, how we can make it happen in the countries so we can encourage more financing that becomes available to SMEs resulting in things like capacity building and financial inclusion. Very largely speaking, this is a very dynamic world. Post-financial crisis, post-2008, some of you may have heard or these terms as Basel, okay, which is a physical geographical location uh, in, in Europe where people have banks, banking regulations have been discussed to say we will not make it happen again. 
we will not let the crisis bring the whole world down to its knees. And so they have tried to come up, they meaning the regulators, have tried to come up with regulations that get the banks to behave, that, that lead to certain discipline on how they lend and to whom they lend. And as a result, there are implications. It's in the process of implementation with Basel III, the latest one taking up to 2019 to get fully implemented, but it will have implications. And the major implication will be to the SMEs and to some of the marginal borrowers. Because as the banks become more selective on how they keep and use their capital, the borrowers will be, the, the good quality bor borrowers will be more in demand. So we'll talk about what those things are, what should we keep in mind, and how do we help growth of supply chains by keeping financial supply chains healthy. Okay, so the first one I just touched upon was financial and legal framework and how when Basel III is implemented, the banks will be asked to differentiate between a good asset, which is a loan, from a good borrower versus a marginal borrower. So no, no, those two dollars on the balance sheet of a bank will not be the same. And if you have a high-risk borrower, you need to keep a higher level of capital on the bank's balance sheet than a low-risk borrower. So it's as simple as that. So now the technique is, how do we use these new regulations and facilitate, if you have payments coming in from a good quality borrower and you borrow at their risk rather than my own risk when I'm a low quality or a marginal borrower. Linking to this is the other thing which most countries have to look for, are two things. Can I assign my receivables? Can I pass on my, and that assignment of receivable becomes critical, and what's the enforceability? What is the value of what the banks are financing? So the underlying infrastructure plays a huge part in doing good financial supply chain and access to capital, which is the key. Businesses cannot grow. The SMEs cannot grow because they only have limited collateral. There's only so much plant, so much machinery that they can mortgage or put up as collateral. And if you look at the service industry, they have actually nothing. If you look at a trading company, their balance sheets have no real physical assets. How do we facilitate them? How do we facilitate a logistics company from growing their business when the payments they get from these large buyers can take up to 30, 60, or 90 days? How do we create capacity for them to borrow? On the regulation, again, the key part which we need to keep in mind is this is our SMEs are a key area for all economies to grow. They create the ecosystem on which the economies survive and they create stability. So while we will continue to have some large dominant players and just we were talking about some examples in certain countries, so Thailand has CP as an example, a very well-known conglomerate. So around CP, you would see a lot of SMEs supplying to them. Okay, here in Malaysia, we would say uh, Petron would be an example. You're going there for a visit, yeah. right? A huge ecosystem of suppliers is around Petron. So we need to have regulations. Now, in certain markets, these regulations have been addressed where the governments have tried to give relief through central bank on portfolios for SMEs, but it's not a consistent, and I just want to make sure that this is one area that needs to be kept in mind. Now let's look at the trade policies. The trade policies are around uh, the, uh, the favorable terms we create or the tariffs we set up to discourage certain kind of imports. All of those things have an impact, not only your trade policies and the things you can import or export, but how much financing becomes available for them as well. Because the banks, all they have to do is manage the risk. And if the volatility is too much and predictability is very high, they will be financing much more conservatively. So to create more financing, the policies need to be in line and they need to stay constant and consistent for a while so that we can create more capacity for the borrowers. 
We touched upon that in the earlier slide on the cost of liquidity. Now typically, and this one also please remember, the largest borrower in most developing countries is the government itself through the government bonds. Okay? So whatever liquidity is available, the governments typically use that through government bonds to borrow from the market. The second largest are your top corporate clients or the last large government-owned entities. And if you really look at it, the ones who are the least to get any financing are the, again, SMEs. Because they're crowded out. They have nothing to offer. So how do we create that capacity for them? How do we make sure that they get access? So the idea is to give some kind of credit enhancement to them. And this credit enhancement can be indirect or direct. A direct form of credit enhancement is credit insurance for default risks. And that provides some level of assurance, and some governments have done that. But the other form is creating these favorable rules that allow large corporations to be able to support these SMEs in those markets. And finally, the, uh, on this particular availability of liquidity is uh, supportive banking schemes. And in this one particularly, I wanted to uh, highlight the agricultural part, because this is where I have come across, and as uh, Dr. Albert was alluding, I was in Vietnam prior to this. So just to take Vietnam's example, um, Vietnam is one of the largest producers of coffee. And uh, they supply two large buyers, let's say like Nestle, big buyers of coffee beans. But they don't buy it directly. So the farmers go in, they give this to uh, small aggregators who will then take it in and give it to the local trader, let's say like Olam, and Olam will then find it to s export it out, or Louis Dreyfus will try to export it out. Now this whole accumulation of coffee, coffee pricing, making sure that Nestle can get this coffee, th that's all supply chain. But how do we make sure that the farmers get the, pr the money, the cash? Because until the coffee is sold, everyone wants to hold on to their cash. Because that cash that is sitting there in the form of coffee beans is inventory. And this whole idea is, how do we create these supply chains that get the cash out to the growers, to the suppliers, for them to be able to supply without providing the extended credit? And this is where the negotiation of pricing comes in. If they have cash, they can negotiate better. Let's look at uh, this one. Uh, and this is a technology-driven trend. So one of the most favorable things that has happened over the last few years is, is technology. It has given easy access to information. Things move faster. We don't need to use as much paper. But what has unfortunately uh, impeded the growth is some of our archaic policies which require us to see a stamp on a piece of paper, right? And in most countries, we still insist, I need to see this red stamp. You don't have the red stamp, I will not process your transaction. You want to pay a tax? No, I will not accept it electronically. I need to see it on this three copies of red stamp paper, right? So if we can get ahead and get on with some of those things and start relying and trusting technology, it will facilitate growth of our business. It will facilitate growth of how the money is made easily available because these technology, and I think the tax collection, one of the big things for the government is tax collection, right? I think the tax collection can be made much more um, better and more effective and better reconciled with technology. Uh, but it takes a big shift, so if the policy can be created around that, it will be something that would help uh, the whole supply chain process. So uh, standing here, it would be uh, naive of me not to talk about what ADB is trying to achieve uh, with Standard Chartered. So ADB decided that um, they wanted to create capacity building as part of that. How do they create access to finance? And one of the things that uh, all of the banks are limited with is their ability to extend credit lines. So when we originate, when we take a risk, there's only so much risk we can take that our capital will allow. Beyond that, we, we, our appetite is full. So ADB has stepped in and said, okay, we will give $800 million of this program to Standard Chartered 
to originate risk and ADB will buy that risk from us, allowing us to originate more. And the whole intent and very well-defined format is that the money should end up with the SMEs. So this whole supply chain initiative and sort of graphical representation is around this. So if we have, just as an example, a Malaysian exporter selling something to a company in the US or China or any of those markets, we finance that trade. They will get paid after 90 days or X period. We can go to ADB and say, listen, we are expecting this risk. We have done this credit, but we don't want to hold on to that risk in our books. Will you buy it? And they will say, sure. We'll risk participate. You keep half the risk. We keep half the risk. Okay. So it's as simple in, in explanation as this one. But this is where ADB is committed to making sure that countries have access to the much needed capital to grow. Um, there's a couple of uh, success stories. Broadly, I'll quickly uh, breeze through them. So one client, uh, leading healthcare company, and, and you have these uh, with you as well, uh, they just wanted to make sure that they are able to uh, have uh, better terms, payment terms, stretch the payment terms. But of course, the supplier has the liquidity constraints. So what it is, it's a simple supplier finance solution. We take the risk on the healthcare company. If you have an invoice that has been accepted, you bring it to the uh, bank. And this, by the way, all happens electronically. No paper is required. So they can bring it to the bank, and we will give that uh, cash as and when the supplier needs it. So if they have 10 invoices, all of them are electronically available to the uh, beneficiary. They can choose the timing as and when they need to draw down on that invoice. And at the maturity, the payer or the buyer knows that the payment has to go to the bank and not to the supplier. It's a fairly straightforward mechanism, but it does create liquidity for the person who's supplying and is waiting to get paid after 60 days or 90 days. The reverse side is also possible, and it goes back to some of the earlier uh, models we were talking about. I recall there were some different types of uh, negotiation models for different industries. So typically, let's say if, I'm just going to say two, two large suppliers of mobile phones, Apple and Samsung. So everyone in this market who is in the cell phone business wants to have their dealership because these are the fastest moving products. They cannot risk as distributors to lose that relationship with them. So in this particular scenario, if the seller of mobile phones wants to push more phones, the dealer can only buy so much. They cannot hold more inventory because they also have limited cap appetite, right? And the manufacturer wants to get their cash. So then what they do is they come to the banks and say, listen, pay this distributor to buy the phone from me. Okay, as that simple as that. And if they don't pay you, I will stop supplying to them. It's as simple as that, but it works. Because no dealer in that kind of relationship wants to jeopardize their main business. Okay, and the cash is converted and the inventory is converted. Thus allowing, now this is one of the many examples and then we have additional ones in the market. This is just a bit of advertising. And uh, that's pretty much it. So no, no, those two dollars on the balance sheet of a bank will not be the same. And if you have a high risk borrower, you need to keep a higher level of capital on the bank's balance sheet than a low risk borrower. So it's as simple as that. So now the technique is, how do we use these new regulations and facilitate if you have payments coming in from a good quality borrower and you borrow at their risk rather than my own risk when I'm a low quality or a marginal borrower. Linking to this is the other thing which most countries have to look for, are two things. Can I assign my receivables? Can I pass on my, and that assignment of receivable becomes critical? And what's the enforceability? What is the value of what the banks are financing? So the underlying infrastructure plays a huge part in doing good financial supply chain and access to capital, which is the key. Businesses cannot grow. The SMEs cannot grow 
because they only have limited collateral. There's only so much plant, so much machinery that they can mortgage or put up as collateral. And if you look at the service industry, they have actually nothing. If you look at a trading company, their balance sheets have no real physical assets. How do we facilitate them? How do we facilitate a logistics company from growing their business when the payments they get from these large buyers can take up to 30, 60, or 90 days? How do we create capacity for them to borrow? On the regulation, again, the key part which we need to keep in mind is this is our SMEs are a key area for all economies to grow. They create the ecosystem on which the economies survive, and they create stability. So while we will continue to have some large dominant players, and just we were talking about some examples in certain countries, so Thailand has CP as an example, a very well-known conglomerate. So around CP, you would see a lot of SMEs supplying to them. Okay, here in Malaysia, we would say uh, Petrom would be an example. You're going there for a visit, yeah. right? A huge ecosystem of suppliers is around Petron. So we need to have regulations. Now, in certain markets, these regulations have been addressed, where the governments have tried to give relief through central bank on portfolios for SMEs, but it's not a consistent, and I just want to make sure that this is one area that needs to be kept in mind. Now let's look at the trade policies. The trade policies are around uh, the, uh, the favorable terms we create or the tariffs we set up to discourage certain kind of imports. All of those things have an impact, not only your trade policies and the things you can import or export, but how much financing becomes available for them as well. Because the banks, all they have to do is manage the risk. And if the volatility is too much, and predictability is very high, they will be financing much more conservatively. So to create more financing, the policies need to be in line and they need to stay constant and consistent for a while so that we can create more capacity for the borrowers. We touched upon that in the earlier slide on the cost of liquidity. Now typically, and this one also please remember, the largest borrower in most developing countries is the government itself, through the government bonds. Okay? So whatever liquidity is available, the governments typically use that through government bonds to borrow from the market. The second largest are your top corporate clients or the last large government-owned entities. And if you really look at it, the ones who are the least to get any financing are, the, again, SMEs because they are crowded out. They have nothing to offer. So how do we create that capacity for them? How do we make sure that they get access? So the idea is to give some kind of credit enhancement to them. And this credit enhancement can be indirect or direct. A direct form of credit enhancement is credit insurance for default risks. And that provides some level of assurance, and some governments have done that. But the other form is creating these favorable rules that allow large corporations to be able to support these SMEs in those markets. And finally, the, uh, on this particular availability of liquidity is uh, supportive banking schemes. And in this one particularly, I wanted to uh, highlight the agricultural part because this is where I have come across, and as uh, Dr. Albert was alluding, I was in Vietnam prior to this. So just to take Vietnam's example, um, Vietnam is one of the largest producers of coffee, and uh, they supply two large buyers, let's say like Nestle, big buyers of coffee beans, but they don't buy it directly. So the farmers go in, they give this to uh, small aggregators who will then take it in and give it to the local trader, let's say like Olam, and Olam will then find it to s export it out, or Louis Dreyfus will try to export it out. Now this whole accumulation of coffee, coffee pricing, making sure that Nestle can get this coffee, th that's all supply chain. But how do we make sure that the farmers get the, pr the money, the cash? Because until the coffee is sold, everyone wants to hold on to their cash. Because that cash that is sitting there in the form of coffee beans is inventory. And this whole idea is how do we create these supply chains 
that get the cash out to the growers, to the suppliers, for them to be able to supply without providing the extended credit. And this is where the negotiation of pricing comes in. If they have cash, they can negotiate better. Let's look at uh, this one. Uh, and this is a technology-driven trend. So one of the most favorable things that has happened over the last few years is, is technology. It has given easy access to information. Things move faster. We don't need to use as much paper. But what has unfortunately uh, impeded the growth is some of our archaic policies which require us to see a stamp on a piece of paper, right? And in most countries, we still insist, I need to see this red stamp. You don't have the red stamp, I will not process your transaction. You want to pay a tax? No, I will not accept it electronically. I need to see it on this three copies of red stamp paper, right? So if we can get ahead and get on with some of those things and start relying and trusting technology, it will facilitate growth of our business. It will facilitate growth of how the money is made easily available because these technology, and I think the tax collection, one of the big things for the government is tax collection, right? I think the tax collection can be made much more um, better and more effective and better reconciled with technology. Uh, but it takes a big shift. So if the policy can be created around that, it will be something that would help uh, the whole supply chain process. So uh, standing here, it would be uh, naive of me not to talk about what ADB is trying to achieve uh, with Standard Chartered. So ADB decided that um, they wanted to create capacity building as part of that. How do they create access to finance? And one of the things that uh, all of the banks are limited with is their ability to extend credit lines. So when we originate, when we take a risk, there's only so much risk we can take that our capital will allow. Beyond that, we, we, our appetite is full. So ADB has stepped in and said, okay, we will give $800 million of this program to Standard Chartered to originate risk, and ADB will buy that risk from us, allowing us to originate more. And the whole intent and very well-defined format is that the money should end up with the SMEs. So this whole supply chain initiative and sort of graphical representation is around this. So if we have, just as an example, a Malaysian exporter selling something to a company in the US or China or any of those markets, we finance that trade. They will get paid after 90 days or X period. We can go to ADB and say, listen, we are expecting this risk. We have done this credit but we don't want to hold on to that risk in our books, will you buy it? And they will say, sure, we'll risk participate, you keep half the risk, we keep half the risk. Okay. So it's as simple in, in explanation as this one. But this is where ADB is committed to making sure that countries have access to the much needed capital to grow. Um, there's a couple of uh, success stories. Broadly, I'll quickly brow uh, breeze through them. So one client, uh, leading healthcare company, and, and you have these uh, with you as well, uh, they just wanted to make sure that they are able to uh, have uh, better terms, payment terms, stretch the payment terms. But of course, the supplier has the liquidity constraints. So what it is, it's a simple supplier finance solution. We take the risk on the healthcare company if you have an invoice that has been accepted, you bring it to the uh, bank, and this, by the way, all happens electronically, no paper is required. So they can bring it to the bank and we will give that uh, cash as and when the supplier needs it. So if they have 10 invoices, all of them are electronically available to the uh, beneficiary, they can choose the timing as and when they need to draw down on that invoice. And at the maturity, the payer or the buyer knows that the payment has to go to the bank and not to the supplier. It's a fairly straightforward mechanism, but it does create liquidity for the person who's supplying and is waiting to get paid after 60 days or 90 days. The reverse side is also possible, and it goes back to some of the 
earlier uh, models we were talking about, I recall there were some different types of uh, negotiation models for different industries. So typically, let's say if, I'm just going to say two, two large suppliers of mobile phones, Apple and Samsung. So everyone in this market who is in the cell phone business wants to have their dealership because these are the fastest moving products. They cannot risk as distributors to lose that relationship with them. So in this particular scenario, if the seller of mobile phones wants to push more phones, the dealer can only buy so much. They cannot hold more inventory because they also have limited cap appetite, right? And the manufacturer wants to get their cash. So then what they do is they come to the banks and say, listen, pay this distributor to buy the phone from me. Okay, as that simple as that. And if they don't pay you, I will stop supplying to them. It's as simple as that, but it works. Because no dealer in that kind of relationship wants to jeopardize their main business. Okay, and the cash is converted and the inventory is converted. Thus allowing, now this is one of the many examples and then we have additional ones in the market. This is just a bit of advertising. And uh, that's pretty much it.